Good morning again, and welcome. We do have some new faces in here. Great to see Pastor Steve Winters, um, Main Degrees Ministries. We had a great time last night, got a good start. I am going to do a little bit of a review this morning on some of the slides, just to try to refocus your attention again to uh, why we're here and where your strength comes from. Last night was the dry stuff. Last night was the why are we here and what is the motivation, what damage can be done or has been done. It was the statistics, it was the curse, it was everything that, uh, everything that we don't want in our lives anymore. And so today we step into the solution. And that solution starts with the cornerstone of Jesus. And it absolutely lays on the foundation of what Jesus has done for us and the promises of his word. So we get more into not only the solution with the secular tools that we talked about last night, but we also now are going to focus more on relationship with the Father, relationship to each other, the church, and family, and what the end result is going to look like for you. So let's talk about some solutions as we get going here this morning. I've got this great clicker this morning. Thank you again. Ministry of Helps. It, little clicker thing for my, look at that. Isn't that, yes, I'm happy with that. I, <laughs> now if I had a laser pointer, I would not have to move. I could just, it's all right. All right, the ground rules. We're going to review these again. This is the platform we're stepping off from. So again, those top two. You're in a good place and you are in a safe place. We have got to everything we talk about and, and where we're at today, we got to take from the standpoint of seeing through those lenses like Pastor Randy had last night, right? But through those lenses that God is a good God and that God is a God of love. That God wants your very best. He only has your best intention in, on his mind. And that he is always striving to give you an opportunity. He is always striving to move you forward, to accelerate you. I'm going to add one to that list that we're going to talk about today. He is always trying to open your eyes to see your own individual capacity. Each one of you have a capacity. It's that capacity is what allows you to step into the new thing, into the change. It allows you the passion that accepts whatever challenge may come with the new opportunity, but the passion, the opportunity, your capacity work together for the advancement in the kingdom. No condemnation. I'd like to see some things go into this bucket, whether they are prayer requests, questions, if they are concerns, or if you just put your name in there because you want to share a testimony. I'd like to see some hands go up in this room. And if I don't start getting some feedback during this, I'm going to put you all on the spot. <laughs> and we're going to start doing some little exercises as a group or something in here, but we are going to get some interaction going in this room. Because as I said last night, you're... <laughs> Your testimonies to one another as a body. We're really going to focus on as a body because the bulk of the people that are in here, the new faces I'm assuming, but LifePoint members. With leadership here and present and with the ability to take what you're learning in this conference and take it to the others within the church, to new people coming to the church, to work as a body together. So encouraging one another to, on this bottom, to be expecting with each other and for one another. Sit here today and don't focus on yourself. Take some time as I'm speaking this morning. Start praying for somebody next to you. Start praying for other people in the room. Start praying about the 250-fold increase in membership here, the 250 members. Pray them in. But be praying for somebody else. Love gives. Love reaches out. Love takes no account of self. So get outside of yourself. And at the same time, hear me as to what the Lord is showing you about changing your own circumstances. A practical course with personal application that involves the spiritual and the natural solutions. And you're going to see the switch today. You're going to feel the dynamic role today, if you were here last night, from where it was at last night with the, the damning statistics of debt in America to now rescuing or being rescued from that position into green pastures. Uh, be expecting and allow conviction to have its course. And then Psalm 1860, he reached down from on high and took hold of me and he drew me out of deep waters. 
Again, it doesn't matter where you're at or how far you've gone. And part of that comes with, there's my lovely family again. Part of that comes with, uh, I'm going to be sharing snippets of my own life as we're going along here because I do believe that the path that I have traveled is going to richly reward at least one person in this room. If any of you have ever been in trouble with the law, if any of you have gotten yourself where you're at the point of bankruptcy, you've got a divorce, a separation, you've got kids that aren't speaking to you, you've got wild teenagers, whatever your situation may be, it makes no difference. None. We're all on an equal playing field in this room. Nobody's greater than another, nobody's lesser than another, but we're all equal. And nobody's story is more tragic than another. Amen? So, about three years ago, two and a half years ago, almost exactly, uh, I went down to a conference down in Orlando, and last night you heard me mention the name Pastor Gary Cassie, Pastor Gary and Pastor Drenda Cassie, Faith Life Church, New Albany, Ohio. And I went to his conference in Orlando, and it was a more intimate setting like this is. There were only 100 people allowed to register, so it was, uh, it was called Kingdom Advance. And Pastor Gary, I had really come to appreciate Pastor Gary. Uh, my wife and I, with our six beautiful children, uh, were having troubles with caring beyond the seventh and eighth week of pregnancy. We lost three in one year in 2015. It was a very, very hard year. And we were desperate. And keep that word in mind, too. And I said that it's in our lowest places that we make the furthest advance. Priorities. Part of priorities is, are you desperate? Are you at the end of your rope with where you're at today? Have you had enough of what the devil has done to your life? So with three in one year, three miscarriages in one year, we were desperate. BVOV had gone online with Kenneth Copeland, and Pastor Gary was one of them that was right from the initiation on BVOV. And my wife started listening to Pastor Gary, and he was talking about kingdom promises and kingdom position and that the promises of God belong to us, that all of the promises in the Bible before Jesus Christ are yes and amen. And to us, the only responsibility we have remaining is to simply say, thank you, God. Amen. And so we started hearing these messages, and my wife said, you know, you really ought to be listening to these. You ought to cue in and hear what he has to say. I, I think it's going to help you. So I did, intently. And January, February, my wife could tell you exact dates, but there was a point in time where my wife and I both agreed that our minds had been filtered enough, renewed enough, cleansed enough of the hurt that we were willing to put a seed into Pastor Gary's ministry and write a letter saying what our prayer request was, that we were believing for another child. And we sent that in and uh, had a baby yet that year. The kingdom promises are yes and amen in the Lord. Three losses, and then we come out with our Ava here. She was the miracle child. So now we're believing for the two more. I put that in last night, so thank you for praying with us. So let's fast forward one year, and I went to Kingdom Advance. And being in a smaller setting, we were all able to have time. They ate with us. They, we literally had two full days with Pastor Gary and Drenda. And the last session, he did a prayer line for everybody to come forward and have laying out of hands. So I went forward, and Pastor Gary placed his hand on my shoulder, and he pulled back, and he said, you're a teacher. The anointing of a teacher is on you. Am I right? And he threw me off, and I stumbled around a little bit. There's a little bit of starstruck going on with me of being right here in front of him with Pastor Gary laying hands on me. I said, yes, you're right. I, I know I'm called to be a teacher. He's like, great, let's call that anointing out, lay hands on you. So they laid hands on me and uh, prayed that that anointing would be drawn out of me. A year later, so now we would be, uh, when we went to leadership conference, Pastor Randy and I, when we first met, so about 16 months ago, uh, I went down to EMIC to Pastor George and Terry Pearson, Kenneth Copeland Ministries, and I went to the Built to Last conference. Dr. Mark Barkley was the keynote at Built to Last and there was a book signing by Bill Winston. He had just come out with his business finance uh, new release. He was doing a book signing, and so I had a book, and that was right up my alley with finance, and Bill Winston is absolutely amazing when it comes to <coughs> spiritual truths and business principles. And so I got in line with the book signing, and it was 
Bill Winston, Pastor George, and Dr. Barkley, right in the line. Now I'll tell you what, you guys may do receiving lines, prayer lines up front, but take those three individuals and that anointing right in a row and go from one to the next under that power as you're going through that line. It was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. Uh, Kelly Copeland, I think, calls it the fire tunnel or something like that, and that's what it felt like. It really did. So Bill Winston, great to meet you. Awesome. Pastor George, you just, Pastor George is just like this walking love. You know, Pastor George is amazing. His, his heart is just so amazing. And I moved over to Dr. Barkley, and Dr. Barkley did the same thing. He took my hand, he pulled back. We need to talk. He's a Marine, you know? That's what he said. He pulled back and he put his finger up and he said, we need to talk. I need your card. So I handed him my card. And a few weeks later, we connected and we talked. And he found out I was coming down to leadership. That's when Randy came over and we went, drove down to leadership. And uh, things moved really fast at that point. It has been 16 months. But uh, credentialed and ordained as a pastor under his ministry, that March, which would now be not even a year ago, 10 months ago, Pastor Randy and I went to another conference with Dr. Barkley. We were sitting at Starbucks down in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and Dr. Barkley just started prophesying. And that went on for what, Randy? He talked for 15 or 20 minutes, and he said, the Lord is calling you out. That's the word apostle, but you're calling out. You're being sent out to take what you've been doing in the secular world and bring it into the kingdom of God. That was the prophecy. That was the launch point. That was the word of the man of God that pushed three degrees into existence, pushed me out of my secular office, and got me standing here in front of you today. So watch for the suddenlies, as others have called it. As you start being obedient, as you start allowing your focus to be God-centered and not self-centered, that you take on, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and what his interests are and his path for your life, watch how she sh he shows up. I have never prayed, I have never asked, nor have I ever sought or even expected to be ever ordained in my lifetime as being a pastor. Never once went to the Lord and said, I want to be ordained. I knew I enjoyed teaching. But I wasn't looking for that. What are you not looking for but God wants to put in your lap? So that's a little bit more of my story as to um, how these truths, these promises, this passion that I have for other people to understand through my own discoveries and my own journey with God, how much I would love to be able to just lay hands on each one of you and to just that, that understanding, that revelation to just become yours, your possession, your prized possession. So please be expecting as we keep talking here now today, be expecting. All right, the spiritual side. The Lord stopped me this morning as I tried to do a different study. And uh, he brought me in a completely different direction this morning. And it was on this slide as I'm sitting in the room this morning. And I'm going to have you all turn to the book of Nehemiah, please. We're going to start off. He said, start your morning with testimony and with Nehemiah to elevate faith. So we're going to spend the next few minutes here elevating faith in this room and getting you ready to believe. How does Jesse put that? Who's the Jesse? Uh, believe the impossible. Ex how does that saying go that he says? Somebody. Somebody in this room knows. Believe the impossible. Receive. All right. Somebody will be inspired with it eventually. All right. So Nehemiah, I know that... Uh, Pastor's been speaking to you and, and uh, studying this book also himself. Uh, but there are, some, there are some things in the book of Nehemiah that I want to pull out of this book. Well worth the read. Well worth the time to sit in this. What an amazing book of leadership. What an amazing book of unity. And what an amazing and awesome book of God on your side. Nehemiah is, in, yes, ma'am. Is it believe the unbelievable and receive the impossible? The impossible. Thank you. Believe, believe, the believe the unbelievable and receive the impossible. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. I knew somebody would get it. All right, so Nehemiah, we're going to look at verse 4, 2 4. This is Nehemiah sitting before the king. The Jews had already, one group of them had already gone back to Jerusalem to start rebuilding the walls in the temple with the prophet Ezra. Now Nehemiah is still back with the king in Babylon and uh, with Artaxerxes. And he gets word from Jerusalem that the walls were not completed yet. They were still laying in ruins. And so he comes in and he's the cupbearer for the king. He comes into the king and, and the king, how awesome is this? He says, what's troubling you? What's bothering you? Verse 4, so the king said to me, what are you requesting about this matter? He had shared with them that the walls are falling apart, and it, it says that he was, I became very much afraid before he told the king what was bothering him. And then he said, what are you requesting about in this matter? So there's a question here. What are you wanting? And I ask you in this room, what are you wanting? <coughs> what are you requesting from me about this matter? Immediately, I prayed. Immediately, I prayed. And it was not a big, long prayer. It was not, let me go in prayer and fast, and I'll get back to you in three days. It was immediately I prayed to the God of heaven and then said to the king, can you see how fast this happened? How quickly the Lord was faithful to his prophet to give him the answer, to give him the request the king had made of what do you want from me? Immediately I prayed, and then I answered. That is the way this can be. That is the way the Christian walk can elevate to, with a relationship with your shepherd, to the need, the request, the emergency, the thing comes up, immediately you pray, and then you respond. And that response may be, Satan, get behind me. That response may be, as the Lord directs you, to call out his promises. But he gave his answer. I prayed, and God backed him, through the king, through a secular king, backed him with everything that he needed. We go down to 2.20. And in 2 verse 20, it says, Then answered I them and said to them, The God of heaven, he will enable us to prosper. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but you will have no portion or right or memorial in Jerusalem. So the locals that were there, the local officials that the king had appointed, had come to Nehemiah when he had gone to Jerusalem and said, How dare you? Are you defying the king? Satan is going to come to you. He is going to challenge you. I said that some of your greatest spiritual battles are going to be to the things that God wants to do positive in your life, to the things that are positive in your life. Listen to this response and start rehearsing it against the enemies that crop up in your life. Nehemiah looked at those men and said, the God of heaven, he will enable us to prosper. That phrase is no different for us today. Our God of heaven will enable us to prosper. He gives the ability. Therefore, we as servants will arise. We will build. And it's not just build, they're rebuilding. You will rebuild where you're at. You will rebuild your lives. You will rebuild your families. You will build this church. We will arise and build. But you, the enemy, debt, Satan, you have no portion. You have no access, nor will we recognize you. <sighs> Chapter 4. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. A little bit of, uh, let's get this going in here, guys. Let the spirit flow. <laughs> All right. Chapter 4. When Sanballat, who was the local official that was such a persecuting <coughs> tool of Satan, can heard that, yes, can I ask a Absolutely. Do we have a handheld for him? What's it mean? We're going to rebuild this church. Yay! All the tables are that way. Now they're all this way. Yay! Count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations knowing that the pastor is a pain in the neck. What does it mean? To rebuild. Huh? Means you have to tear something down first. Means you have to tear it up, tear it up, tear it down, rethink everything. What is it that you've got to rethink? No, don't you don't have to go deep. But what is it you gotta rethink? The 
about about the church, huh? The, the operations in the process. Right. Like what? How do we have church in a hotel? We were in a building. Yep. See, that's a good question. So if we're going to rebuild it, TJ says, okay, we've got to tear this up because what you're doing now attracts 50 people. Right? What does it look like when you're attracting 250 people? What has to change? If you took whatever you're doing in your life and you times it by 10, what you can't do that the same. If you, you know, you got one debt and you can work a little overtime and you can stay the same and still get her done. But if you got to go 10 times, you cannot stay the same. You just have to whole, it's a paradigm shift. You have to change everything. And so what is the paradigm? What is the way of thinking that we have to change? Your excellence is not going to grow the church. If it did, you'd already done it. Facing reality is what's going to grow the church. Yay! <laughs> so just give me at least one example of, TJ, you're going to tear something down. What would, what would that be? It doesn't have to be personal or in here, but what, what would it be? What would you tear up? Uh, stop borrowing money. What? Stop borrowing money. Stop borrowing money. Find another way. Or don't do it. <laughs> Give God an opportunity to show up. God can't show up if you're the one. This is one thing that I can't stand besides hijacking another guy's time is... <laughs> is we go ahead and do something and then say, oh, glory to God, when he had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Amen. We did it. Amen. You know what I mean? Oh, come on, man. You just did that. Pat yourself on the back, you know, smile and go on. But if God is going to do something, you'll say stuff like, isn't he amazing? He did this. Look what he did. God did this. So stop Spending the, uh, stop using the credit. That's what you said. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one thing you can do. Do, do one more from the quiet side. <clears throat> What's one more? Tear down your idols? Down your idols? Mm -hmm. Holy smokes, you went there. What is that? Oh, say it again, sister. This is the way that we've done it. This is the way the church did it 20 years ago, and this is the way God wants to do it tomorrow. Yes. Are there other, somebody else has been doing it like this, and yeah. it succeeded for them. And so then that's what we have to do. We set it up as an idol. Yeah. And we worship it, and it's not going anywhere. It's dead in its tracks. It's because we're too lazy to spend time with God to see what he wants us to actually do. This place, this church, this anointing has its... See, you are the body of Christ. It doesn't look the same without you in it. Unless your particular gifts are brought here, this doesn't look the same. That's what makes you different. That's what gives you identity. Because it is different. It's not like everyone else, because you showed up. You're there. The, the, you are the why. X, Y, Z, you are the reason. You are what makes it good. You'll go to somebody's house. You'll pray with them. You'll agree with them. You'll disciple them. You'll be there. You'll support them. You'll do that. So you, you're right. Tear down the idols. Who cares how somebody with a big name does it? Big deal. Tear it up. Turn it around. What if it doesn't work? What if it don't work? <clears throat> Big deal. 
I guarantee you, no one will forget last night when we were here till 11.30. Remember that meeting? We were there till 11.30 and the guy wanted to do tables. Learning happened. Uncomfortable happened. We have to be willing to make ourselves uncomfortable. So, you know, Pastor Steve, when you ask that question, it, it's really worth diving into. Is that you ask for help. You're like, okay, we have to have some help in here. So I'm just helping. I don't remember saying that. I, I don't remember asking. <laughs> like, we have to. You ask for help. I help. Am I good? Yeah, you, you're, you, you proceed. Do we need to keep, do we need to hang on to that? Or can you handle your toys? Can you behave? No answer. No, he didn't respond. Touch the wall. Yeah, right. Stop. Okay. Um, I'm going to touch a couple more points here on Nehemiah, and uh, we'll get into the next set of slides here. So Nehemiah 4. Again, just an example there of Nehemiah and the Lord finding it important as he's writing out these scriptures, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here's the Lord again demonstrating Nehemiah's position. And his position was at the throne. He prays again in verse 4 that Sam Ballad again raises opposition. Nehemiah does not respond in emotion. He goes to prayer. Nehemiah led in the spirit, not by emotion. He led with the vision of a completed wall. That was the goal in front of him. You set your goals in front of you personally for a family and as a church. You set your goals in front of you and then you work towards those goals. And we're going to get into the plan this morning yet. We're going to talk about your plan and sticking to your plan. In verse 14, talk about opposition. After I looked around, I stood up. 414. After I looked around, I stood up. And I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, stop being terrified because of them, Sanballat and his people, Remember instead that the Lord is great and awesome. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Remind yourself of the great things that God has done and of his promises and who your Lord is. So fight for each other. That is such a key phrase in this book. That is the unity. That is a church. That is a flock, a like-minded body of believers. That is life point. Amen. You do not sit in a conference like this and get smarter so that you can go out and regurgitate information to another person and tell them how much trouble they're in financially, but you can get out of it. You really can. I, I went to this great seminar, and you know what? This guy stood up there forever telling us how we can get out of this stuff. But I'm not doing it myself. But I sure can judge you. That's not fighting for each other. That's fighting with each other. So you unite. Remember this bottom verse here? Deuteronomy 25, 17? Remember what Amalek did. To you by the road, when you were coming out of Egypt, when he met you by the way, Satan will meet you. He will. God will meet you where you're at, but so will Satan. He'll meet you in the way, and he's going to try to get in your way. He attacked at the rear, all the stragglers. You want to stop losing people? Identify the stragglers. You want to retain membership? Get next to the stragglers. Practice giving to the stragglers. Oh, they're just going to go spend it on booze. I know them. Smokes. It's none of your business. That's right. If the Lord told you, right. give, you give. And you give it with joy and you give it generously. Amen. And then he gives seed to the sower. Amen. 16 and 17. Opposition. Are you willing to follow this example? After that day, half of my servants did the work while the other half handled the spears. Wow. I have to work while somebody watches over my back with a spear in their hands? Shields, bows, and body armor. Commanders were appointed to support every house of Judah. Okay. Small groups. Commanders were appointed to watch over the houses. Leadership. Are you watching over your member houses? Do you have any of your members appointed to you that you're watching over? that there is the X, Y, and Z even within the congregation, within the body? Commanders were assigned. 
to every house. Those rebuilding the wall and those hauling the loads were working with one hand doing the task and the other hand holding their weapon. And that is what I'm going to encourage you to follow through on from today on, that you have one hand doing the task. You have one hand doing what God is asking you to do and your other hand is holding your sword. Your other hand is right here. Meditate day and night in my word and it will go well with you, he tells Joshua. One sword in the hand, one sword doing the task. You keep this in front of you. You will not fail. Amen. You will not fail. Nor will the Satan gain ground. Boy, am I looking forward to a tithing message. <laughs> and then one more, and this, uh, this is, again, just so dear to my heart. Five, six. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. The Jews had come and there was, I mean, we could look above that and it ties right into this, but they had taken loans and they were, came to Nehemiah and said, the usury, the interest they're charging is more than we can bear. We're losing everything we own because of what we owe them, because of interest. They were in bondage to debt and the loan holders were merciless, absolutely merciless. So they came, there's so many points you can make on this. Number one, they didn't keep it to themselves. No one here is their own island. Isn't that the way the song goes? We're a body. Every member knit together and doing what they're called to do. If one member suffers, we all suffer. If one member rejoices, we all rejoice. All right. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words, so I contemplated. He meditated. He again did not reply in emotion. He took a minute. You come to Pastor Tommy, Pastor Lynette, I got a problem. And they don't give you an immediate response? Don't keep talking and telling them in a different angle what your problem is. They heard you. Give them a minute to step back. Lord, download. What am I replying to this individual? Give them a minute. They don't need to hear it all over again. I rebuked the nobles and officials and said to them, based on your claim against your exacting usury interest, leadership is going to stand in your stead for justice. You know what I mean by standing for justice? What is justice? In scriptural terms, what is justice? If something is just... If something is righteous, what does that mean? It's right according to the Lord. It's, who said that? Way down there. Good answer. It is in right standing in the Lord's sight. It is his will and well-pleasing. It is just. It is kingdom principle enforced on your behalf because you're a child of God and a tither. That is justice. Your leadership will stand for justice in your life. And leadership is also going to bring correction. As you look here, he brought correction. In, uh, he rebuked the nobles. Based on the claim of each against his brother, you are exacting usury. Then I convened a great assembly against them, and they'll find a solution. So there's leadership appointed in this church. Nehemiah and the book of Nehemiah is an awesome study regarding leadership and how leadership is going to intervene with you if you allow it. It's going to take humility. It's going to take uh, honesty for that to happen. But I promise you that this is setting a foundation where when we start looking at these solutions, and it's not going fast enough, or it's not having the effect that I said in this room that it would have in your life, or you're not seeing things break and shake loose and experiencing the suddenlies, the temptation to quit is going to be intense. The temptation to say, I give up, I'm going back to the way it was, I was at least surviving and I had peace, manufactured peace, I quit. Very good. In 5.15, B, second half, moreover, even their, uh, cert okay, he's talking about how the governors before him had been taking advantage of the people and then he says, furthermore, I, I, but I myself never did so because of the fear of God. 
Furthermore, I stayed determined in the work on this wall, the purpose. We bought no field and all my servants were gathered there for the sake of the work. I myself never did take advantage of man, never took advantage of position, never held my authority over another individual, nor did I ever look to man to meet my needs. When we look to man to meet our needs, you have stopped faith and now you are looking at man. You are no longer seeking first the kingdom of God. You're looking at man and you will use manipulation and you will use whatever means that you've habitually used previously to get what you want by using a man. You can take authority and lord it over another person. Nehemiah is a series of messages that is so rich in truth and wisdom about the government of your home, being head of household, about maintaining peace and security in your home, and the government of a church, and business. Nehemiah is an awesome book for any businessman that wants to do business by the book. You study out Nehemiah as to what it is to have employees, people under you. You study out Nehemiah as what it is to have vision and go for a purpose. My intent was to build the wall. He had a plan. He stuck to it. So, Nehemiah, awesome book of the Bible, bring to you some truths from there as we step into what we have now for today. Amen. Amen. How did I get here? We hit that one. I'm just going to fast forward here to, you know what? Let's go to this one for a minute. I told you you'd see this one again. As we talk about freeing up money today, as we get into restructuring, finding money, balancing your budget, and then we actually get to the point where we're looking at now putting money away for ourselves, instead of coming back to the slide, 20 slides, I'm gonna say this now. The same orange lines that I use to talk about how your mortgage accelerates in principal payments over time, but it takes 22 years to get 50% of your home ownership back in your own hands, but then only eight years to pay off the remaining balance. And that's pretty average for every mortgage, by the way. The same thing is true with investments. It takes patience, it's a slow growth, but there will be a day where your investments are going to do this, with that exponential hike in that ramping up of those, that bar chart. So this chart not only shows how debt takes advantage of you, or how you can take care of yourself in retirement, but is also a great visual as to how your investments will accelerate if you leave the money alone, and you have them in a good place, and you keep adding to it. You enjoy compound interest at the same time you're compounding your principal. And this is what happens. All of a sudden, that bar starts multiplying every year, and you have got a return coming each year that'll make you just rejoice. Praise the Lord for it. Okay, true nature of debt. All right. Back to this slide. Where do I begin? Honesty. Last night I asked a question in closing as we were leaving here. I'll be honest with every one of you. I've told two of individuals in this room already, but I'll be real honest with each one of you. That was a firm instruction of the Lord. That was a direct request of the Lord to say who in here needs to know the Lord Jesus again as their first love or to come to him for the first time. Nobody responded. And the Lord told my heart, when I ended the session, if you rewatch last night's session, we ended the session with me saying twice, honesty. People in this room were not being honest. That's what the Lord said. There's people in this room, they're not being honest. I'll tell you what, you showed up here. And because you showed up here, the Lord showed up here. He does not want to leave you where you are. But if you ignore him, give me a call next week and ask me how your budget's going. Or let's put it this way. You don't hear the spiritual side of this and you only take the natural side. I'm going to give you the natural way of getting out of debt. And you can ignore everything I say about the word of God. But I'm going to call you in three to five years from now. I'm going to ask you, how's it going? You're going to be worse off than you started. You'll be worse off than you started. You'll be deeper in debt, you'll be more depressed, you'll have more strained relationships, and you're going to be more desperate. 
Honesty. And maybe when you asked last night, what comes before honesty? My answer to you should have been expanded to say humility. Maybe that's where we need to begin in here. Humility. So yeah, last night was pretty sober. I watched myself last night. I flipped on YouTube and I go ahead and watched myself last night and uh, Randy asked me, how was it? I said, I almost got saved again last night. Um, we covered a lot of stuff, but I'm realizing as I rewatch myself, it's the first time I've ever done that. 48 years, I have never just simply watched myself speak. And uh, to hear it from your chair, last night was pretty dry. It's pretty intense, deep, convicting if you allowed it to be, but uh, some heavy stuff. Not only the condition of the nation, but bringing it all the way down to your own checkbook and where things are at with your own checkbook. So, you survived and you're back. Congratulations. That's awesome. All right. Yes? Um, I was trying not to say that, but I, I don't think anybody in here knows me any better than those two people right here and my son. And I say this because you and I talked a little bit and we did what we talked about. Should I have the microphone? They can't hear me? That, there's no way that YouTube is hearing you. Oh, oh, sorry. Where's the handheld? I got it. All right. You got this? Give it to the man of God over here, please. Here I come. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm praying, right? No. Um, no I, I just wanted to say, um, in saying that, one of the things that I will say about myself is that as I have operated in the office of the bishop throughout the body, um, I've been told I'm too humble. And uh, I think I'm saying this only because of what you just said, that they will say, I think I'll have a witness that they can say I'm a humble, I've been a humble man. Um, so when you said that, I re related that to what the Lord told me early in the morning, this morning I was praying. And he said, trust who you are. Trust what you've always been and then obey what you hear. So I took that to be, just be the man you've always been. That's when humble. you said that just now, you know, it brings me to tears because I'm like, oh, well then that's exactly, you know. But he did tell me, he said, trust what you hear in this, in this meeting. This is for your benefit. This is for your future, so. Amen, thank you. Amen. Nothing to add to that? <laughs> okay then. All right, budgets. Who in here has got a budget? Whoa, really? Okay, let's try this again. Get your hands up. Who's got an honest budget? Honest budget, and you stick to it. Let's add that to it. Ooh, I lost, okay. All right, congratulations on the hands I got. It's the first time in a class I've gotten hands on who has a budget. First time. I've done this class to Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, and full gospel. It's the first time I've gotten hands. So even some of the most conservative ones didn't have a budget. So for those of you that have a budget, how is it working? Yeah. Okay, tell us about it. Nice and loud. Where's that mic? Uh, I've been wanting to hear from you anyway. Really Pastor Randy asked me last night, did you notice such and such? And I said, you know what? I really didn't because this gentleman right here had my attention last night. Mm -hmm. I've been wanting to hear from you. Go ahead. Uh, I actually keep it in my wallet. Um, and, uh, hello. Oh, sorry. Um, I actually keep it in my wallet and I'll, I'll refer to it and, um, it works very well. I've had a budget for years now. I've always made sure of it. And so that way I actually need to update it because bills have recently changed and stuff. So I got to update it. Uh, but I try to keep it very up to date and I like having a budget and that's why I keep it in my wallet. So that way, if I'm figuring out something, if I need to go to the bank or pay something, I have it right there with me so I can look at it and be like, yeah, okay, right yeah, it's in my wallet right now. Uh, yeah, I just wrote it down on a piece of notebook paper. Yeah. Well, you don't have to, 
<laughs> I, I see it. I believe you. <laughs> yep. Insurance truck. So. It's real. <laughs> but I mean, I I really like having uh, having my budget because it helps keeps me focused, especially when things when mishaps happen. It allows me to like, okay, this is how much I gotta play with. This is what I can do. Okay. So. Awesome. How's that? That deserves a hand of a, that, every yeah that that bravo. First, there's always going to be first, and I should never be surprised by the first. So thank you for that. So a positive budget, and does it run positive? Are you? Do you have a positive budget? Yes. You have a positive budget. Yes. Okay. You're going to be a big tool in here. All right. Yes, ma'am. You have something you want to say? No. Okay. Ninety-five, ninety-eight percent of the time, there is no budget. And by the time you write one out, it's so upside down, it's not even funny. They're underwater every month. They don't even see it until they write their budget. So they make up their budget, and they realize that the leak, $100, $200 a month, it might be slow, but at $100, $200 a month, plus the interest that they're accruing every month in addition on their credit cards adds up to quite a bit by the end of the year. And so we always want to start with our budget. And I brought handouts here. I, yes. Absolutely. What, what is, I mean, a budget. Like? All right. I'm going to be handing these out. In fact, let me hang on to one. You guys go ahead. There's a hundred of these, so you guys could all take like three if you wanted to. I was going to explain things a little bit first, but we're just going to go right to the template. Now, this is just simply pulled from the Federal Trade Commission, from the FTC because it was thorough enough to cover what I wanted to cover here in the class, but a budget will be unique to your needs, which is why you, it's a dynamic document for you. You're modifying it, you're editing it, you're changing it. Income changes, you change the budget. You're doing a lot of things right. I hope that you're picking up some new ideas and tools while we're talking here today. All right, so your budget. I might get ahead of my slides here a little bit, but I'm just going to talk and not even refer to the slides for a few minutes. So if you can't see this, you're not missing anything. A budget is simply a tool that you cannot be married to because it does not need to remain dynamic, but a budget is simply a tool to honestly lay out your income, which is your disposable income, not the gross income, Uncle Sam has a say about the gross income. So your net income, disposable income, gets laid out on the budget, and then all of your expenses, your monthly payments, and whatever you spend money on, dues, subscriptions, athletic clubs, whatever it may be, all get listed. And at the end, when you're all done, your total monthly expenses should not be greater than your total monthly income. It should balance, yes. Can I ask a question? So I'm self-employed. My husband is self-employed. Ooh, are we going to have fun? It's really, really difficult because that's part of the reason why we don't have a budget is because both being self-employed, we don't know what we're getting. We don't know how much work we have. We don't know, like this week, I have had almost every one of my appointments canceled because of the weather. So I've had one. I've got it. I've had it yesterday. I've got two, uh, two this week. So, so that makes it really, really difficult. We are going to address that. Yeah. The, the unpredictable cash flow, yeah. we're going to address that. I had a question down here. Let me come back to you, ma'am. And there's a lot today that you're going to want to hear with the self-employment, the taxes, the insurance, and the budget, business budget, personal budget. Yeah. What was the question down here? Oh, no, sorry. I was excited that you were going to self-employment because I'm self-employed too. Got it. Too. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you're... It is. It is. Except for the church, you've got this thing with income called tithes. And so what we want to talk about when we're talking about tithing is, in Iowa and it's 20 below, you most likely have individuals in your church that decide that on October 1st it's simply too cold to exist here, and they head south. And there's a very good chance that once they head south, you're not seeing any of their normal tithe coming back. 
So do you smooth out the average? Do you do something to inspire them to be sending tithes back home again to their home church? We're going to talk about that. But yeah, it's cyclical. It's unfortunately fortunate when a church has to suffer from cyclical giving. And we'll talk about that. So, good. We're getting some, some banter. I like this. Good. All right. So the budget is pretty self-explanatory. You've got your income and your other income. If you're a single mom, you're getting alimony, you're getting child support, that would go into your income line. That's, that becomes disposable income. All of your expenses. And giving is on here. Uh, I made sure it was on here before I printed it off. Underneath personal and family, it, third from the bottom, backside, is donations. For a true, proper budget, when this line is filled out up here on the income, the very next line you should fill in should be the donations. And we will just call that your tithe, 10% of whatever that income line is. Now, it's between you and God if you're giving off gross or net. Completely up to you. I am not going there with you today or tomorrow. It's between you and God if you're going to go gross or net on your giving for 10%. So you lay this all out. Income minus expenses equals what? Plus or minus on the back. So are you underwater or are you having a positive number each month? I'm going to teach you how to make your number positive no matter where you're at, no matter what your income is. We're going to talk about that. Um, a cyclical cash flow or an unpredictable cash flow, do you know what I mean when I say a smoothing average? You, a smoothing average, you take a historical data and you find out what the averages are in each of your categories of expense and income. I'm going to call it a 90-day look back. So go back 90 days. Now, if I say 90 days and you take me literally, we go right through Christmas. Now, let me ask you if December spending looks a little bit different than June spending. Okay, so please hear me loosely when I say a 90-day look back. Don't include December. Budget your December so that it doesn't affect the budget that you write for your 90-day smoothing. But don't count December for this work, okay? What if, in my case, I have a Christmas account. Every week they take money out of my paycheck. Yes. So at the end of the year, I have $1,300 to spend. If it's coming out of your paycheck, it'll never appear on your net income. It's already gone. Okay. It's a budget item in an envelope that won't be part of this because you're going to go with the net on your paycheck. Okay? okay? Uh, see, 90-day look back. Use January... November, pick three months. And the easiest way to draw those numbers in are from statements. Your checking statement, your credit card statements, and to take, sit down with them, you and your spouse, do it together, and go through your statements and add up what you had for food, add up what you had for utilities, add up what you had for monthly payments. You add those numbers up for the three months, divide by three. That's your average. That's what would actually go onto your budget sheet. And that's the number that you should begin with. Always ready to modify, always ready to edit, especially if income changes. Okay? So an average 90-day look back, and that's why I said take more than one copy of the sheet if you wanted to, because what we're talking about here, I've just got to ask. Did anybody leave here last night or get up this morning over breakfast and start writing out bills? Okay. We do. <laughs> Pardon? I did it yesterday during, like, Fantastic. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's awesome. So this would be the next step. You write all of your bills, and the very next step now is to start writing out the budget. So if you've been running a budget already, that's very easy work for you folks down there. For you, for the ones that have already been doing a budget, that work may already be accomplished and done, which is great. The budget can get kind of tedious. It can get even downright depressing. And I'm telling you, don't allow it, because there are going to be ways where we're going to talk about finding money of even expanding your cash flow beyond your paycheck just by changing a few things of what you're currently doing or getting rid of the unessential things that you have but you don't really need or that the Lord says you don't want that anymore. Trust me, it's not for you. So we're going to talk about those things also. So did I don't know where my stack, I brought 100. Did everybody get multiple copies or is there just a stack link somewhere that I can lay out and people can grab more? What do we have back there, Caleb? Is there a, yeah, there's a whole stack. So if anybody's interested in doing this work yet this weekend, uh, you can do that. Otherwise, like this form is a fillable PDF online, and there are a multiple uh, number of sites where you are, I'm just going to set them up here, 
uh, there's a multiple of sites where you can go and actually do it online. It's like a calculator. You fill in all of yours, but to do it on paper first, to have a reference that all you've got to do is plug numbers. If you want to go online and do it, you can use Microsoft Excel if you want to be on technology, if you're savvy enough for that. But there are, debt has become such an issue in America that the nonprofit debt counseling centers, most of which are secular, are popping up quite frequently. There's new ones that are coming to the surface that you can go online and find them. Just watch out for anything that's fee-based. There's enough free ones where you don't need to be paying somebody to talk to you about how to get out of debt. Sounds backwards, doesn't it? Paying somebody to tell you how to get out of debt? I'm already upside down. I'm going to pay out more money now. All right. So are there any questions on this particular form? Do any of those categories not make sense to you? Or is, this, uh, is that short explanation enough on what this form or what a simple budget may look like for you? This one right here is actually from the FTC. It's from the Federal Trade Commission. But like I said, if you just Google, or whatever your search engine preference is, um, online budget tool, you'll have a large selection. I was going to say one thing that people might want to add is they don't have, like, I mean, they don't have a Christmas account already set up, is to have a hold account, and you can put your to add a hold account, and that's where you would put money for if you want to go on a vacation and be able to pay for it up front. You have your Christmas money in that hold account, and most importantly, you have extra money in that account to cover emergencies. Right here. We're getting there. <laughs> Years ago, a, a, a good friend of mine said, uh, most people do their books at the end of the month and ask where the money went. But if you do, do this at right. the beginning of the month, then you tell your money where it goes. It's about being proactive. He's saying that a lot of people do their money at the end of the month, not really following the money, the cash flow during the month, and at the end they realize you know, where to go. Everything we talk about in here is going to be proactive. Everything in here, we are going to stop responding to emergencies or responding to crises. We're going to stop my goodness, the tire just blew it on the car. How in the world can we get a new tire? That shouldn't exist in our lives. We should not have these crises. We have other things that our attention should be on of the Lord. I was going to say, one of the things that I've, and I've experienced this, I've got a couple of daughters. And with, with online banking today, it's so easy for people to, you know, click on their account and say, oh, I've got this much money in the bank, but they don't realize they may have written a check. There, there could be outstanding checks there. So what you see in your bank is not exactly no. what you have. And using an old-fashioned register, checkbook register, is really beneficial to have because then you really have a solid idea of how much available funds you really have instead of play, you know, looking at the bank and thinking you have more than what you really do. And um, you can also set up like your hold account in that register where you can, you know, because what I have in my checkbook register is not exactly what I have in my account because I've got a second section in my account that I, you know, I keep track of as a hold. And it's my backup money. And I don't even have it showing on my everyday expenses. So, what she's Sorry. What she's referring to, uh, I would simply say that it is scriptural. It is mandated and required that if you are going to call yourself a steward of the resources that God has given you, that you know where your money is. And you know how much you have in each account that you hold. It's part of being a steward in the sight of God. Balancing your checkbook. Simple thing, especially now when you've got so many online tools. If you are just tech, that the old-fashioned pen and paper thing just doesn't exist in your life anymore, and there are people like that, very much so. They don't even carry a Bible anymore. Everything is done right on their phone. Um, if you are that way, then on your phone, keep a register. QuickBooks Online, great self-employment tool, $30 a month, and it's all-inclusive. I'm running a $3 million construction company right now using QuickBooks Online at $30 a month, and it works phenomenal. You talk about an overhead savings. We were paying $7,000 a year for the financial system. 
How did the company grow that quickly? Capacity. Finding where our resources are. Where are we leaking money? You cancel that subscription, and you take on a subscription for $30, $360 a year, as opposed to $7,000. It adds up. Quick, the fragments. The fragments. Exactly. Praise God. All right. Um, so I'm not coming off the budget. I'm just coming away from this form for a minute. Okay? We're going to be on budget for a minute here. So just let me backtrack to my slides. We'll keep fielding questions, but let's keep talking about the budget. Okay? So majority of household budgets are negative, but you need to honestly know how negative it is, and don't be afraid of a negative number. Credit cards have allowed people to keep shopping even when the money's gone. Oh, there's a mouthful. Okay, how do you do a balanced budget if you're just whipping out a credit card? Because I won't see that for 30 days. That doesn't count in this month's budget. You spent the money this month, right? It's part of your budget. I don't care if it doesn't ride, if it doesn't show in your statement for this particular month, it doesn't matter. That balance needs to be paid in full. And we're going to talk about credit cards in just a minute. It's on the next slide. The top line is, what is your stewardship for credit card? What will God allow and that you can have peace in credit card use? The three-month look back is the 90-day look back that I was just talking about. Don't use December. The cash reserve. The blown tire. The dryer just fried. Baby needs braces. Okay. The cash reserve, two to three thousand dollars, and that to you, some of you may sound like, yeah, you got to be kidding. Two to three thousand dollars sitting in a savings account that I'm not allowed to use. That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about because it takes the pressure off the oopsies. It takes the pressure off the oh no, hey honey, guess what? The cash reserve is a critical component for peace, and once you have that cash reserve. I'll tell you, there are people that want to do a victory dance. They feel like they have achieved and overcome and won a victory. And it is a driver to the next thing that we're about to get to. I'll flip a slide here. Do not be bashful in writing in your budget a reward. Go ahead. Find it in your budget and write in for yourself a reward. Small, but something. New purse, new pair of shoes dinner out with the wife, whatever it may be. But when you hit these milestones, when you hit a place that it's a near goal and it gets accomplished, celebrate. Do something about it and praise the Lord. Okay. First two objectives are a balanced budget, capitalized, underlined, and in bold, and a cash reserve. A balanced budget does not have to mean drastic changes to your lifestyle. It's about the fourth time I've said this. And I know some of you still shake your heads when I say that. How is that possible? There's no way I'm going to balance my budget and not change my lifestyle. Listen. For about the next hour, just listen. And we'll show you how this is done. Where's my clicker? All right. I threw this slide in this morning because of the Lord speaking to me and saying, elevate faith. This is a spiritual journey and you need to separate. We need to separate if I were to do this class to a classroom full of businessmen that don't acknowledge God, as opposed to being in here with like-minded, full gospel believers, the presentation becomes extremely different. I would probably say no to the first invitation. I'm not interested. I'm in the business world, and I deal with a lot of people that don't acknowledge God. But doing it in business, as opposed to giving my pearls to swine? Enough said? All right, this is a spiritual journey. And I've got a whole sheet of scripture I'm going to be handing out here today to you as we get towards the end. The sword in the right hand. One hand doing the task, the other hand holding the sword. Proverbs 3, 13 and 14. How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her profit, wisdom, the profit of wisdom is better than any balance sheet or profit and loss statement. It's better than the profit of silver, and her gain is better than the best portfolio, better than fine gold. Wisdom. And where do we get wisdom from? The Word. The Word of God from the Lord. Again, priorities. Be honest. Priorities. What is your priority? I am not going to pep talk you to rearrange priorities. 
My voice is nothing but a container of words coming to your ears. If you're hearing me from here and you're not expecting, if you're not listening in the spirit, if you're not asking the Lord to decipher my words, to give you ears to hear and eyes to see, to do it his way and to flip your priorities, you're wasting your time today. You're wasting your time. Priorities. Money is not about you, but rather about what God can do through you. You know that? Money's not about you. Money has nothing to do with you. It's not who you are. It's not your status. It's not your place. Nor is it your concern. If it weren't for God, would you have money? 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything you may have an abundance for every good deed. Familiar verse, but have we ever allowed ourselves to sit still and meditate on that? Have you ever taken a minute to say, Lord, there's a lot in this verse that doesn't come true in my life. Haven't seen it yet. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. That first line right there takes away the lust god from your life, the idol, and uh, doesn't care about how shiny or new or beautiful Joe Bob next door just got. Love does not brag and it's not arrogant. We don't lord over others our success. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Oh, there's so much I can say on that. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Our God is love. He loves you. You ever stood in the mirror and just looked at yourself and said, God loves you. He loves me. Jesus loves me. God loves me. He wants the very best for me. This is a spiritual journey, and God is already so far ahead of you, just by faith, catch up to him. He's already got the solution. He's already got the answer. He's already got your victory. He's already got your abundance for every good work. Okay, balanced budget. Best credit card use for you. Do you have no discipline? Is it travel only purposes? Do you indeed pay it in full or do you need to go to cash only in envelopes? Because the Lord is saying, don't do it. This will remain a fiery dart of the enemy, a weapon formed against you and it will continue to defeat you every day of your life. What is the discipline of a credit card that is suited to you personally? What is your budget, not their budget? What is your daily little reward, not their little reward? What is your income, not their income? There's no comparisons in here. I don't care at all what you make in a year. I only care about getting the truth of this class, that you've got a balance, but you've got all the tools you have to flip whatever is going on wrong in your life on its head and succeed. So what is the credit card use that's best suited for you? Travel. It's almost impossible to travel now without a credit card. So that would be one use of a credit card that unless you are traveling, the credit card gets put away. There's a story of a couple that were going through financial consulting, counseling, and the meeting happened where we're going over the budget and counseling them on how to have a positive budget. And the question was asked, what have you done with your credit cards? Because there was like 17 credit cards. And the wife goes over to the freezer and opens up the freezer and pulls out a bowl. And in that bowl of frozen water on the bottom are all our credit cards. We couldn't get rid of them just in case. But boy, we have time to think about our purchase when we wait for them to thaw. (laughs) It's a true story. That's a true story. So what's the best credit card to use for you? Maybe that's one of the first things you've got to set before the Lord. And if that is sitting on an altar, not of God, it's an idol. It needs to go. Sleep on your purchases and be in agreement with your spouse. 
How many people in here are married? Most of you. Do you have financial conversation with your wives, with your husbands? Do you just lay it all out there as to how much is coming in? I know the budgets do. How much is coming in? How much is going out? Bigger purchases? Need a new pair of shoes? Do you talk about these things? You have to. You really do. You've got to be in agreement with your spouse. Unless two agree, how can they walk together? And sleep on your purchases. You know? It's more than set a dollar limit with your spouse or for yourself. What's the dollar limit? Anything over $50? I'm not going to buy it today. I'm not jumping on Amazon or into my car. I'm going to wait. I'm going to think about it. And if I still think I need it in the morning or in two or three days from now, go to the Lord. If it's a big purchase, ask him. It says, make a prayer or a goal board. You know, I was going to use the word vision board, but I didn't want to step on Terry Savelle's toes. So I said a goal board instead. I learned vision board from Terry Savelle first. And she did a series on, on Jerry Savelle's program on what a vision board is. And I would recommend that for every single person in this room. I don't care how wealthy you are. A vision board, do you guys, have you heard any of the teaching? Or do you know what I mean by a vision board? Have you taught on vision boards? Okay. A vision board. You simply take a board. My girls use a cork board down in their bedroom. And they've got a vision board. And some of the stuff they have on their vision board is so creative. I am so impressed and proud of them. You need a new car. It goes on the vision board. You need a vacation. It goes on the vision board. Orthodontics goes on the vision board if insurance doesn't cover it. What is it that you want to believe God for? Test me in this. What an awesome invitation of the Lord, Malachi 3. Test me in this. Bring all your tithes and I'll rebuke the devourer. Test me in this if I do not open the windows of heaven. But put it on that board, lay your hands on it, and put it before the Lord and say, this is what we're believing for. But make a vision board. Give yourself something to work towards. Give the Lord something to work towards with you. Prepaid and gift cards. They become a dime a dozen. And so now I can add this to my presentation. This used to not be on my presentation. But if you are so undisciplined, we're going to be getting to taxes. One of the most common frustrations that I deal with between the companies, there's 38 employees that I'm responsible for payroll. W-2s, W-4s, uh, 38 of them. I try politely and in love, to talk to new employees that maybe don't understand the purpose of a w, uh, W-4 well, and we're going to talk about W-4s when we get to taxes, that you don't want the government holding your money for you. And their response to me almost 100% of the time is, we have no discipline to save. And so we file a zero, even though I'm married with three kids, I put a zero for my withholding, so the government is extracting as much money as they possibly can get their hands on all year long, so that I can get a fat check in spring. And my response to them, again, in love, is if you are so undisciplined that you can't put 20 bucks a week into a savings account, I promise you, you're abusing that check when it comes from the IRS. You're not doing anything good with it either. So prepaid and gift cards. Maybe that's the way you need to go. That your budget sits on a gift card, so that you're not carrying cash. You're not carrying a credit card. But instead, you carry a $300 prepaid visa. You carry a $50 Starbucks card, and you carry a $100 whatever your favorite restaurant chain is card. That's your budget. When the card's gone, you reload it on the first of the next month, but until then, get frozen pizza. That's good. That's very good. So uh, plan a menu and stick to a grocery list. So my wife, bless her heart, uh, you talk about a manager of a household, uh, she is Proverbs 31, and yes, I'm biased. I'm married to the woman, but I'm so proud of her. She is absolutely amazing. We go grocery shopping down in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's a two-hour drive for us from Iron Mountain. Why do we go to Green Bay? Because we've learned that stewardship does not only include our finances and our time and the things that are important to God, but Kenneth Copeland and the others have very much given us revelation that stewardship is also temple maintenance. We eat a very healthy, strict diet. All of us, all eight. The kids don't complain. It's actually, she does excellent with her menu. 
So we go down to Woodman's in Green Bay, which in Iron Mountain, the same ingredients in Iron Mountain are so expensive, it's worth my gas to go to Green Bay and have a day with the family when we go grocery shopping. All eight of us going through Woodman's buying two weeks worth of groceries. It's quite a hoot. You should see us in the airport. You should see us go through an airport. We've got eight, 16, 14 suitcases and shuffling kids and trying to get through security. You know, TSA is great. We have never waited in line. The eight of us show up with the double stroller and all of our baby gear and the, the kids are fussing or whatever's going on. And the TSA has so much pity on us that they come and they open up the fast track lane and we go in front of the priority customers and we zip through security. We are always early for our flight, always. <laughs> Favor of the Lord. Favor. All right, plan a menu. So we go grocery shopping once every two weeks, and we buy our list. Now produce, we will supplement produce and the perishables in the in-between, but it's budgeted. But make a grocery list, and don't go shopping hungry. Stick to your list. Do you know how much money you can save if you just write out a menu, and do you know how much healthier you'll eat if you have an actual menu? Yeah, it's gonna require some more work. It's called stewardship. It's called obedience. It's whatever the Lord would lay out for you, but make a grocery list. Structure. Make a plan and stick to it. This is the hard one. This is where discipline, patience, contentment, and all the fruit of the Spirit come into play in one document, and that's your plan. And I don't care if that's your individual plan, if it's a family plan, if it's a business plan, if it's a church plan and a church vision. It's still a plan. And if you've done it, in stewardship for the Lord, it's God's plan for you and your family and for your church, for your business. You make a plan. In the business world, we call it a business plan. And I actually am going to talk about business plans when we get to self-employment. <clears throat> but this is your structure. If you don't have structure, you will never fulfill your capacity. You'll never find it. You've got to have structure. How many businesses can just show Throw open the doors at 8 o'clock in the morning, close the doors at 5 o'clock at night, and whatever happens, happens. You can't run your house that way either. You can't run your budget that way. It's not going to work. You can't do anything shooting from the hip and call it structure. You need the plan. You've got to have something in place that becomes the thing you go back to when you get off track. We missed it this month, hon. We're down $200 on our budget. We missed it. Let's go back to the plan. Let's go back and look to see where we steered wrong. Where did we get off track? Structure. We're going to hit that hard again later on today. Find money. Okay. Here is where you are going to have to humble yourselves and find some discipline for your household as to the non-essentials. I'm saying you do not need to change your lifestyle. You may not need to, but is the Lord asking you to? Or does just a little tweaking of your lifestyle necessary in order to balance your budget out? If you've got a coffee habit, if you've got a movie habit, if you've got a subscription habit, if you've got the $200 cable subscription with 5,000 channels, is there something there that's non-essential? Is there anything there that you can possibly look at and honestly say to yourself, I don't need it? Do you know what $100 media bill a month can do for your budget? And let's take it one step further. Do you know what it can do for your family? For your own peace? To not go to bed with all those horrible images on your brain as you're trying to fall asleep? Sanctified, set apart for the Lord God's use, a vessel fit for the master's use, always ready, in and out of season, to explain the joy that's within you. What are you doing to protect the joy? Or what can you give up to protect the joy and protect what the Lord has done for you? It's going to go much further than the natural and dives right into the spiritual for an application that has a natural method with a spiritual result. Right? Okay. So finding money. There is a lot here that you can look at in your lives. The New Year's resolution you just made 31 days ago that you are no longer doing whatsoever and you don't even think about it when the alarm goes off in the morning, you know that the majority, I'm not going to put a number on it, it's a very, very high number, but you know, statistics can prove anything you want them to prove. You just have to manipulate them. 
But most New Year's resolutions that involve exercising and dieting, the, there's a tax day and there's a New Year's resolution day, January 16th. By January 16th, most New Year's resolutions have been abandoned. Done. Cancel something. If you're not going to the club, or if you can do the same thing at home, or better yet, how about just right around your neighborhood or in your own backyard? Get out of the house. It's healthy. It's free. We live in a closed neighborhood. It's 1.7 miles. Uh, just beautiful. I should share that testimony with you all. God is so good. Um, I got laid off. We went there last night when I got unemployed. Um, that was at you know, the inception, of the beginning of trying to create a family and, and settle. But before that actually happened, I'm working this $30,000 a year job, and I'm going to a full gospel church locally in Iron Mountain. I think it had nine members. I went to church with eight other people. And uh, Alice and I got engaged, and we're about to get married. And the pastor pulled me to the side of church and said, I need to talk to you. I'm like, all right. And I was living in a second-level apartment with a steep set of long stairs in a 110-year-old building, two bedrooms, no pets, 900 square feet total. The bathroom looked more like a mini submarine than a bathroom. It was this narrow little hallway and, anyway, very cramped. Allison has two daughters, a dog, and a cat. No pets allowed. There's a problem here on the busiest street in town. Let's throw that in there too. So I'm in this apartment and the pastor comes over to the apartment he comes upstairs and he said, you are so out of place. I got scolded. I got rebuked by my pastor. I'm out of place. That I'm not doing anything to look for a place to live, proper housing for my new family. That I'm being irresponsible. I said, Pastor, Alice and I both have agreed that the Lord has shown us that I'm to wait. That I'm supposed to just be patient. That one day my phone's going to ring, the suddenlies, my phone's going to ring and it's going to be the house that he has reserved for us. He got mad. He left. We didn't settle anything. He just, it was just offense. That's all it was, just offense. That was like in March. Elsa and I got married in May. I'm working for this trucking company. And I'm the operations manager, so I had a lot of control over who got what loads. And Elsa and I prayed. And she was living in Bloomington, Illinois at the time with the girls. And so we prayed that a load would get called in that would go through Bloomington, Illinois, that I could pick my driver, and that it would be on this day to go down with a moving truck reserved on a Friday. So we laid that prayer out before the Lord so that we could at least get her back to Illinois. Still had no place to put everything, didn't have the house. And that Wednesday, don't get impatient. God knows what he's doing. Don't let the midnight hour hit and you panic and you go and find the servant girl of your wife. You don't want an Ishmael in your life. Amen? Amen? Boy, I should come back and visit that one in a few minutes. Yeah, amen. So we were pretty much at the midnight hours, Wednesday at noon. And uh, the phone rang, and I answered it. And it was what the guys called, the drivers called, a cherry load. It was a two-stop load running equipment, so it's just chains and go on a flatbed. And the first stop was Bloomington, Illinois. Bloomington, Illinois. Amen. The very city that we said, I need a load that goes through Bloomington, Illinois, beyond all we can expect or imagine. It went to Bloomington, Illinois. Two. That was the stop. So I called up Dwayne. He's my favorite driver. And I said, I got a great load for you. He loved going to Texas. The load went on to Texas. I said, I'm going to offer you this load if you want. He said, yeah, I'll take it. I said, it comes with a, with a uh, partial. That's what we called if you just fill up the rest of your trailer, if you got extra room, it comes with a partial. I said, you get to take me with you. He's like, fantastic. My, my driver, no problem. So Friday, we're about to go. We're going to pull out on Friday. We're going to leave and get down to Bloomington and be in their town about 10 o'clock at night. Allison's going to pick me up, load the moving van, and bring it back to Iron Mountain to a house that doesn't belong to us yet. And uh, I'm in the breezeway of that, the same breezeway I talked about last night where I called Allison to say I no longer have a job. That same breezeway, same location, I'm staying there. My phone rang. My cell phone. Cell phone. How hard is it to find a cell phone online? You don't. You don't. My cell phone rang in my pocket. And a lady I'd never met, never heard of, had no clue who she was, called and said, hi, my name is such and such, and I understand you're looking for a house to live in. 
I said, I'll take it. She said, you've not seen it. I said, I'll take it. She said, well, what about rent? I said, well, currently I'm paying $450 a month for my upstairs apartment, and that's about the most that I can afford. She said, you know what? That's too much money. Let's make it $400, and it's yours. I live on two acres of land just outside of town on a lake in a closed neighborhood that has a second lake, and we're in this home renting it for $400 a month, and once my wife and I start making motions of obedience, the Lord shows up, meets you where you're at, it wasn't but a couple of years, and we bought that house. I'm still living there. The Lord not only had the house picked out, as I told Pastor, but he permanently picked it out for us. And our family could not be happier. Two acres of wooded land, huge backyard for the kids on a lake. God is good. <clears throat> Sell non-essential items, and then the bottom one there with financial restructuring. I could spend an entire day just teaching you about financial restructuring. And that is a great topic for you to be making phone calls to me as I head back home and we part ways on Sunday. Please let there be some follow-up because there are some topics here I just need to blow through so that we can get through the rest of the material. That's going to be one of them. I'm going to touch on it to get you started. But it's one of the most powerful tools you have is financial restructuring. I did it for myself. And I'm going to give you my own testimony of my own debt freedom as we get into how you actually apply all this. And we'll go back and we'll revisit some of these that are more personal to you as questions come in. But selling non-essential items, I don't know if any of you guys in here are hot rodders or if you've got your dirt bikes, your ATVs, maybe there's a boat. Is there something in your life that's maybe only getting used once or twice a year or it's something that is just costing an arm and a leg, something that is really not blessing your family but it sure blesses you? Is there a non-essential and if the Lord would say, you know what, they still make them, get out of debt, and I'll give you one that's even better, even bigger, even shinier. Seriously, look at that. And be transparent. And be allowed to let go. Give yourself permission to let go. You know, your cash reserve is most commonly and most efficiently, the cash reserve is met by the guy that's got the Firebird in the garage that never gets driven because he doesn't want it to get another mile on it. It's nothing but a lawn ornament sitting in his garage. So the wife parks out in the driveway, but his Firebird is sure in the heated garage and taken care of with a tarp over the top of it. And the wife with three kids in tow and the baby is going out through the elements to go and get in the vehicle that's sitting in the driveway. You sell the Firebird and you not only have one credit card paid off, you've got your cash reserve and you're well on your way to debt freedom. But get off your pedestal and allow yourself to let go a little bit and to get in the game. And I promise you, I could go scripture after scripture after scripture where the man or woman of God did this, this, and God shows up. Hit the rock and watch what happens, Moses. Wham! The water comes. Hit the rock. Speak to it. Get rid of it. Whatever it may be. Find the money. Sell the non-essential. Let go, and I'll say it again. They'll still make them. Get out of debt and then go find what you really want and pay cash. All right. I'm going to get off that for a minute. We can come back to that one. That one's usually the one that makes me the unpopular one in the room. All right. Budget tools. And this is where I was talking about there's so much that's online. Every dollar... That's a Dave Ramsey thing. Dave Ramsey's got a pretty awesome program out there about debt freedom and the envelope system. If any of you have done his program, um, he's worth checking out. It's another avenue. And if you can put a twist on anything you're learning in here, I'm not in any competition with anybody. There's plenty of other people in debt I can go talk to. So this is the unending job pool is what I do. There is no end. Uh, budget calculators. I just put in a simple little, and then copy paste it. I just put in some simple numbers in here just to give you an idea of what a budget calculator is. It's called a budget buster from uh, Debt Reduction Services. It's a .org online that I found. And I just did a, a snip of this little graph that they have. I thought it was pretty cool. But you put in the daily expense, okay, or whatever you're going to spend the money on, $5. It becomes $10 a week because you do it twice. It fills in the fields automatically. So what is the amount, and how often do you do it each week? And then it calculates it out. So every week you're spending 
on your $5 cup of coffee, which Starbucks right now I think is up to about $8.50 for some of their mixed ones, but $10 a week here, $43.33 a month, $520 a year. So if you have a $5 twice a week habit, it's costing your budget $520 a year out of your net income. If you're earning $36,000 to $48,000 a year and you're married or you have a kid or you've got rent and a house payment and you don't have other income coming in, that $520 becomes a big deal. Whereas if you're earning $100,000 a year and you've got the wife, the kid, and the house payment, you're not going to feel it as much. But punch in what your other habit is that's not just $5. Maybe it's the manicure. Maybe it's the country club. You choose. Maybe it's the season tickets to the Iowa Buckeyes, Hawkeyes. <laughs> Who are the Buckeyes? Ohio. Who? Ohio. Sorry if I stepped on toes on that one. Part of our non-essentials, my 18 and 16-year-old, and especially the 9 through 0, 2-year-old, my 18 and 16-year-old have never been in a classroom. They're homeschooled. We homeschool all six kids. Bless her heart, Allison. She manages that house, and she homeschools six, six kids. Two, they have never had television. Never. We have no subscriptions. We have no television. We have no newspapers. We have no magazines. It's a natural blessing on the budget, but it is a spiritual high to see where they're at today. Uh, free credit report once a year. Go pull yours. Start off the new year by pulling your credit report. Annualcreditreport.com. Go get it. Look at it. Uh, credit reports are man-made. They are very, very imperfect. There's a likely chance you're going to find a problem. So I pulled my credit report. I went to buy a car when I was about 20 years old. And uh, a lot of this was foreign to me. I was in college, and I already had my law degree. And, and uh, so I wasn't ignorant of some of these things. But I couldn't figure out why the bank was like salivating for my business. Oh, you can borrow more. You don't need to stop. Why would you stop at this amount when you've got all this? My dad's credit report merged with my credit report, and so I had all of my dad's stuff, his occupation, his income, his very, very little debt, all registering on my credit report. Then my lines of credit were wide open. I had no loans. By the way, my dad's a pastor, so he had no mortgage on the credit report. So we had to separate out the two credit reports. You are allowed to amend and appeal your credit report but there's a chance you have to do it three times. TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. Your credit report is going to tell you which agency has a mistake, but being that they feed each other, there's a good chance that one has fed bad information to another. Okay? Check out your credit report. You get one free one a year. After that, you'd have to go to something like transunion.com, and it's like $29 a month. It gets really expensive after the first one. But there are options out there where you can pull your credit report more than once a year. You just got to pay for it. At least I have not found where you can get a second one in the same year for free. And loan calculators, like bank rate. I think I actually have a template of one. Nope, I didn't put it in here. All right, so you can go to bankrate.com. I gave you the website instead. Bankrate.com has got all different varieties of calculators, where you can do your loan amortization calculator, you can do a depreciation calculator, you can do a savings calculator, you can do a budget calculator. But these loan calculators, that if you want to go after a major purchase, or if you want to buy a house, a car, you can actually go to Bankrate and find out where you're going to be at for your monthly commitment to plug it into your budget before you ever even show up at the dealership. Or better yet, you go to the dealership, and even though they will more than likely try to talk you into a nicer, better, more expensive vehicle, that you can go in and say, I have this much money to spend, and I will not entertain anything over. Because you know from Bankrate what your budget can afford. You don't go buy the car and then go to your budget and make your budget work to the car. So we, uh, um, my wife just talked to me this morning, and she said, you know, I really think that the Lord is saying that people would be blessed to hear what we do for transportation. I knew that there's going to be more about me here this morning, so just hear the stories, hear what I've done. I said I've personally traveled this road. We have eight kids, so we've had a 12-passenger van. Eight kids, eight, eight. Excuse me, six kids. I'm sorry, there's eight family. Yeah. 
I, well, there you, you're speaking it. Yes, amen. I have eight kids. I should go put two car seats in my van right now. It's a 12-passenger van, and I tell the Lord, I still have capacity. High seats are not full. My quiver's definitely not full. So, I, uh, Ava's born, and we're driving a Suburban, which they say is seven to eight passengers, and I would say it's really a six passenger. But uh, we were in a situation of, you know, getting six kids home in a Suburban from the hospital. And so that very next week, I sat before the Lord and said, Suburban is done. We don't fit it anymore, so I'm forced to take on another purchase, even though we didn't want to the Suburban. The, okay, to Chevy's credit, it was a favorite vehicle I've ever owned. Chevy Suburban was a cool car. Um, and I asked the Lord to uh, give us 12 passenger. And so I'm driving home from the office one day, and the Lord said, go check, uh, it was Craigslist, go, go look at Craigslist in the valley. So I went home onto Craigslist, and the van we now have in our driveway was that van, where he said, go home and check Craigslist for your van, it's there. And uh, it was like, one of those situations where you think God is sitting in the passenger seat riding shotgun and he's speaking to you that clearly and cleanly. And so I went home, I pulled it up, I called the phone number, I said, that van is sold. We first negotiated. The Lord gave me, you know, I will pay you this much, not this much. Um, bought the van with cash for 3,500 bucks. 120,000 miles on a 12-passenger Chevy Express van. $3,500 cash. Retail on it was 8,500. That's the Lord. I've got your van on Craigslist. So I called the guy up, and I said, that van is sold. I'm coming down with cash, $3,500. I'm going to drive it home tonight. You haven't seen it. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. You haven't seen it. Right. doesn't matter. I want it. Right. When you've got the confidence of the Lord, and you are able to have that kind of assertiveness towards a purchase, that kind of confidence, oh, life becomes simple. There's no shopping around. There's no, well, there's this one, and then there's this one. Well, this is good here, and this is not so good over here, and here's the pros and cons. I called the guy up. I said, it's sold. I'll be down there in a few hours. I called up a friend. I said, can you drive me down to Appleton, down to the valley? Sure. I had that van within four hours, five hours, paid cash. And that van, I've got a nicer minivan, but uh, uh, that white van has never been in the shop. We've had it now for over two years, two years and three months. It's never been in the shop. It was a God purchase. It's never been in the shop. It has never failed us, and it is just, it's so roomy and perfect for our family. God knows. He knows your need. But like Nehemiah, what did he do first? The request was made. What did he do first? He prayed. Get God involved. He wants to be. So, and so now, I've not had a car payment in 10 years. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yep. I've not had a car payment in 10 years. And uh, the white van is now, we've put 54,000 miles on it in the last 27 months. And uh, it's due. But the message and all that that my wife wanted you to hear is, even though we would really appreciate a new van, we postpone, we stay content with the white one until such time that the cash buys us the next one. And that came from my wife, so thank you, honey. Thank you. So... Uh, All right, I'll try to get through budgets here, and then I want to get into the actual plan for how we get ourselves out of debt and how we apply the money that we have found, the positive money we have in our budget, and the payments that we're already making. It all comes together in a nice spreadsheet, and we're going to go over that here in just a minute. So as we're doing our budget, again, just laying the base of the spirituality behind stewardship, behind money, God is generous, and he does not want us to live deprived but we are called to be faithful with what we've been given. I think I've made several different comments to that angle already, that he does not want us to deprive ourselves. He's a God of blessing. He's a good God that gives abundance. But at the same time, he does call us to be a steward of what he's already given to us. And once we're faithful with the little things, what comes next? The increases. The faithful with the big things, right? The increase, right. But be faithful with the little things. Be faithful with what he's given you. God will meet you once you start with pure motive. Now, I was going to go to James 4, but I am going to save a little bit of time here. 
But James 4, what does it say about James 4? You ask but receive not because you ask with the wrong motive. You ask amiss. You're asking to spend it on your own lustful, sinful self rather than what God would have given this to you for originally. You've got a selfish motive. James chapter 4. God will meet you once you start with a pure motive. That is part of the humility. That is part of the honesty. That is part of the transparency. That is the part of getting with God and finding out your place, where he has you, and where he's taking you next. God has entrusted you with a dominion that may be very concealed right now because of our choices, but has always been available to you. God has entrusted you with a dominion that may be very concealed right now so that the mysteries of the kingdom are hidden away for the righteous, not from, but for. That there are mysteries, that there are things, there's wisdom. God gives witty ideas. It's right out of Proverbs. God gives witty ideas to his faithful ones. Okay? So your dominion may be very concealed right now that all you're seeing are Randy's glasses, his lenses. That all you're seeing is a negative checkbook, a negative budget, three hungry kids, and a broke down car in the driveway. Your dominion may be very concealed right now. Adopt the vision, own the vision, but disown the position. We talked about that last night. Do not take that position as being your place or your lot in life. Reject the status quo. It doesn't belong to you. God gave us free will, and it says, use it wisely. I want to go back to that last note. I didn't finish that. Your dominion has always been available to you. It's always been there, and it's still there, and it's not going away. He gives his gifts without repentance. He doesn't take them back again. Your giftings, your anointing, your calling, your place in the church, in the body of believers, your head of household position, your wife of a sound and safe and stable home, Your position, as it is seen in what you're holding in your right hand of the sword, your position is this. God's word has final say. God's word has final say. Your dominion, that is part of your dominion. The 7,000 promises of God are your dominion. Your immediate area of control, your circle of influence, your employer, your employment, the people you work for, the pastors you serve are your dominion. It should look like the way God describes it. It's always been there for you. It will always be there for you. Your choice is going to determine if you find it or not. God gave us free will. Use it wisely. That's that choice. If we do not have choice, I guess a lot of people describe our ability to make choices, what allows us to love God and prove our love for God. But he gave us choice. Free will allows you to walk out the victory that is already yours or not. It's your choice. You can have it or not. You can have, res- you can have results or excuses, but you don't get both. Amen. You can have results or excuses, but you can't have both. Path to debt freedom. Once you have a balanced budget and a cash reserve, and I would really ask, I think it'd be a great exercise. I'd, I've run out of time this morning. I, I just simply, my course is normally 16 hours. Now, I don't have 16 hours, so I'm trying to skip. I'm trying to get the meat into you so that there's the, the foundation to work from. Uh, but once you have a balanced budget and your cash reserve, but this balanced budget, if we have time on Saturday, and any of you have sat down during the course of today, tomorrow morning, and you actually have started working on your budget and it's still negative, sit with me. Pull me to the side. Let's work through it while I'm still here in person. Otherwise, we're leaving you with phone numbers. Uh, Gradual but steady. Don't something the small beginnings. What did you say to me on the phone? Don't, Don't despise the small beginnings. Gradual but steady. Um, I've got it in scripture verses here, but 
Exodus 23, 29 to 30. I'm just going to read them to save time. Exodus 23, 29 to 30. I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to possess the land. Until you have increased enough to possess the land. Until you have learned to occupy the capacity that God has shown you. He will not do it all at one time. It will be little by little so that the wild animals and the other occupants that need to go away, your idols, until those have been dealt with, you get little by little. You're faithful with the little. You prove yourself in the little. Now we go to the next thing. But as you grow, as you increase, God will teach you to occupy what you have so that you may have dominion over that thing and that then he will give you the next instruction on how to expand your tent pegs. All right? And then I have here, what are you saying? Um, I'd like to dive into that too, but what's coming out of your mouth? When you go sideways on the highway, are you yelling, I'm done? Or are you yelling, wheel straight? <laughs> what are you yelling? <laughs> You're still kicking yourself over that and stopping Um. My heart calmed down about two and a half hours after that happened, actually. Um, I'm, there we go. All right, th this clicker, I'm going to thank it again. The health ministry gets a huge hooray in here, <laughs> let alone the whole rearranging of the furniture. We really do get along. We do. We're friends. We, we do get along. We do well together. Um, where are we at here? Your tongue sets a course for your life that's either evil or good. There's probably enough understanding in this room that I could lightly touch on that. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And the bottom note there before we dive forward is stop relying on debt. It is selfish. It is not becoming. Love is, we read 1 Corinthians 13 where the becoming word is used. Stop relying on debt. It's selfish. Debt does not only affect you, it affects your family, your future, and your purpose. Stop relying on debt. Okay. Once you have the balance budget and the cash reserve, it's now time to do the restructuring of the debt. And I would really, really like to dive into this. It is a powerful, secular tool that mankind has created, and it can work to your advantage in a dozen different ways. The definition of restructuring debt is very simply taking your smaller balances or your high interest balances and applying for and being approved for a different debt instrument that will pay off those smaller balances, bring them into one installment loan at a lower interest payment, and that restructuring just got rid of this huge lump of cash that goes out of your wallet each month to make minimum payments brought it into one, and usually the restructuring, the result of that is you've got a minimum one card of $120 a month, you've got another minimum on this such and such vehicle for another 80, and then there's a car payment where you only owe $2,000, but the payment is $420 a month. So you restructure your eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 of debt, and you just get $600 back in your monthly budget, but your installment loan for a 36-month term is $140 a month. You just got $460 a month back into your budget. That by itself, a simple restructuring, is enough to turn most budgets positive. It is only the most unruly and wild children that have a budget that that usually doesn't satisfy. The ones that have really pampered themselves, and they've got all these subscriptions, and they've got all these activities. The young. Need I say more? or those that have not found wisdom. All right, <clears throat> debt is a way to find money. Remember my first slide where I said we're gonna use debt to find money? Here we go. We're gonna use debt to get you money. How many of you could use $400 a month more in your budget? Would it make all the difference? How many of you carry balances that would be probably pretty easy to consolidate and bring it into one installment? Most of everybody in this room, probably. How many of you are willing to consolidate, but then whatever you paid off, don't open another line. 
Don't do it again and repeat the insanity. Pay it off. Be done with it. Be faithful to your payments and watch what the Lord can do in three, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Just watch. All right, so let me talk about restructuring for another minute longer yet. First, deal with the non-essentials. Discipline yourself. Get rid of the fire bird in the garage. Get rid of the $45, $60, $80 Xbox purchases. Quit killing brain cells. First, deal with the non-essentials. Discipline some of the choices that were previously made. Discipline yourself. What does restructuring involve? Refinance, second mortgage, personal loan. I'm going to hit that in just a moment. Focus on the higher interest debt to be paid off by a lower interest vehicle or the other alternative to that is if you don't really have the high interest vehicle that they're all running 8 to 12%, the other option on that is find the smallest balances and pay off as many small ones as you can and put that minimum that you were making on the small balances, make that your initial starting payment when we do our, our repayment plan. Next slide, okay? So focus on the higher interest debt. It's best to get rid of the higher interest because we talked last night, that's your biggest leak. That's where the most money is being wasted and you're just making somebody else rich because you're renting their money. We want to get rid of the high interest. But if your highest credit card balance is also your highest interest, maybe you don't even qualify to pay that off. Maybe you can't borrow that amount. But when you go to the bank, you need to tell them this is a debt consolidation personal loan. You identify it as debt consolidation. Why? Because your credit report has got credit card A, B, and car payment B, C, all listed on the credit report. The bank has got to abide to the debt ratio. They can't let you go over 40%. But if it's a debt consolidation and you're already approved for those loans, you already know it's within your 40% debt ratio and you will get approved. Okay? Good? Hold? Yeah, absolutely. Financial. Yep. Um, I don't know. I've, I've, I've been thinking about letting my son know about this because he's in debt up to his eyeballs right now. But, oh, sorry. Um, have you heard anything about that? If it works, whether or not it, you have to put down a payment before you actually get them to work with you for consolidation? Do you know anything about it? The, uh, it's the follow through. Not necessarily if there's a payment that's due or a fee based service. It's the follow through. It's the ability to come into a room like this and be held accountable to a church, to be held accountable to a shepherd, and to submit yourself in that position of authority for the follow-through. It's going to be the hardest thing, and we're going to talk about it tomorrow. But as we leave here and you're finishing this conference, your follow-through with patience and contentment and accountability are hard. They really are. So you can go to those services, and they're great. Every one of them, they pretty much have the same goal in mind with the debt services, the envelope system, they all have different strategies, they have different approaches. But what is the follow through when you use an online service? Rather than finding somebody that you trust in person, flesh and blood, to hold you accountable. You know, you can do an online tool, Triple um, X Church out in Washington for pornography, that you can put a watchdog on your cell phone. But it's a remote site that has workarounds. You turn off the app, do your thing, come back onto the app, however it may, the workaround may be. But a remote-based accountability service does not help with the flesh. So if you have a relationship such with your son that you could be in that position of authority to him, which would be a huge honor to mom, but if that does not exist, does he know, does he know the Lord? Okay, so he knows the Lord. Is there somebody in his life that could be accountable to serve him for what he needs? Think about that. Pray about it. The Lord always has a way of escape. That person is there. Okay. So, yes, those online services, they're great. I'm going to introduce you to Ford Financial, which is Gary Cassie's service. And for them, there's follow-through. You actually get assigned, like myself. In fact, if I just hit escape here for a minute, and I come here, we're three degrees. Our website is threedegrees.training. I meant to mention this at the beginning. That is not what I'm supposed to be looking at. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll come back to this. <laughs> so, um, am I on? Okay. I'm seeing a desktop. 
No, I'll just start my presentation again and just, uh, there's a presentation, but my web, my browser's not showing, my screen's not showing. It's, it, yeah, it's extended. Okay, you know what? <laughs> we'll just let that one go. Um, oh, look at this. Okay. So that's our website. I don't know how you're doing that, but there, ECG Financial. Um, my self-employment is this, ECG Financial. And I know it's going to be very hard to see. Um, it's very hard for me to see, and it's not on my screen. OK, let me get low here. Um, ECG Financial is my, my company. And you can go to Three Degrees, and there's a link that will take you to ECG, and you can read through this. There's a residential or a personal private side, and there's a commercial side. But on the personal side, this is non-fee based with follow through. This is a very similar offering as what Ford Financial Group does because you simply are assigned an account manager. Somebody that walks you through your debt repayment plan that we're about to hit and then will be available. You dial my phone, I answer it. It's that simple. Um, FaceTime, whatever. But the stuff that we're talking about here, I have a whole company that does this. And the follow through is available for anybody that wants to be um, taking this to the end and celebrating at the end with the victory. Amen. So balanced budgets, money management and strategy, recognized loss areas, debt elimination, thank you, debt elimination, investment and retirement planning, wealth management, insurance review, compliance recommendations. Is there any way to scroll that? Here we go, look at this. The Ministry of Helps, I love the Ministry of Helps. Uh, insurance review compliance recommendations, tax review compliance recommendations, on-site financial workshops and Bible studies, commercial, leadership and management training, structure and organizational compliance with government agencies, cost and profit analysis, and employee benefits. That's what I do. But for you people, it's free. For the world, they pay dearly. So um, the industry world covers my time and expenses to do this. Amen. Amen. So that's ECG. And I said it last night, I'll say it again. You guys are first. You want to take advantage of this? There's never going to be a charge. Amen. The Lord has been good to me. Let me give back. Down here, yes. Okay, I want to go back to the slideshow then, please. You probably, it's probably up there. But I just wanted to see, is that also for learning about stocks and bonds? Is that cover yeah, that area? Part of the wealth bit. management, the retirement planning. Okay, a little so bit different tomorrow, area. tomorrow, hang around tomorrow, and we're going to hit, uh, Joshua and Caleb approached me last night and asked a very good question that I'm actually going to field for all of you, but asking how do I get my 14-year-old involved, in, 14 involved in investing? It was a great conversation, but not nearly enough time to answer it appropriately last night. So we're going to take that up tomorrow. Okay? All right. Uh, Matt? More. Yes. Quick question. Uh, the personal debt consolidation loan, is that, does credit score come into a factor when trying to get that, or is it just based on your 40% debt? Uh, they're going to definitely pull a credit score. Okay. They absolutely will. But again, you've already been approved for whatever you've got in that credit report. It's already part of your 40%. And so with that, there is a lot of opportunity to go to a bank and to structure a loan. The other alternatives to the personal unsecured loan, if they're not willing to go that route, is to go towards the second mortgage where now you've got a backing of collateral. That if you're offering the bank collateral, this is the route I took. When I went through Ford Financial and Gary Cassie's program, this is the route that I took, is that my wife and I took a second mortgage on our house, paid everything off, and we have a much lower 20-year amortized fixed rate loan as a second mortgage on this lake home that we moved into for half the price that it was, that's the other part of the testimony, we bought it for half what it was appraised for. So I had lots of equity in my home and I was able to consolidate the debts, put it into a first and second mortgage and the collateral backed that other loan. But I was a debt fiend. 
I am such the other side of the pit right now, Psalm 1816, that verse from earlier, I was so hungry for debt and consumption that I really got my family into a pickle. I was the culprit. I was the blame. That second mortgage gave us a new lease on opportunity, paid off the interest credit cards and the loans, and now we make our first mortgage and our second mortgage payment. And then just for the record, when I went through Ford Financial, my wife helped me go through the timeline this morning. When I went through Ford Financial and went through their debt plan and their strategy for repayment, our repayment was... Look at here. We're going to have two screens. <coughs> Praise God. Um, our debt repayment for completely out of debt was just over seven years. That was mortgage student loans. That was everything. Just over seven years. Like the student loan coming off last year, that was part of my plan. That we have something that we run to if we get off track. We have a plan. I'm going to teach you how to do a plan. We just recalculated it now this morning. And because the Lord is faithful and will show up, when you show a little interest and pure motive, the Lord shows up with a whole lot of motive. My income has gone up such that in less than five years, everything is gone. In less than five years, I am absolutely entirely free from the world. That's God. Amen. So, it is possible. It does work. But I went into, it started off as just over seven years. Things change. I accelerated my student loan, got that paid off last year, and because that got accelerated, I was able to ac accelerate other things, and it's, it literally knocked two years off of our plan. Okay? So, restructuring. Refinancing a second mortgage or a personal loan. The personal loan would be un... There'd be no, uh, no assets. It'd be a non-backed loan. So whatever you would qualify for to consolidate and get your budget back, to take priority or position over your budget. Focus on the higher interest, we read that one, and then accelerate debt payments is what this slide is. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. This is bringing it all together. You now have your positive budget, you now have your case cash reserve, and you've restructured debt. So instead of this individual, this is a real scenario, instead of this individual having three other credit cards on this plan, They've been consolidated into a personal loan. So they borrowed 31.1 and paid off 31.1 of credit card debt. That brought their liabilities down to four payments a month instead of what would have been six. It would have been three and three, the three credit cards. So now they have four payments a month. The first mortgage, the second mortgage, they had themselves $191,766 in debt. Is that number staggering to any of you? Yeah. I'm $191,000 in debt, married with kids. Okay, But watch what happens here. We get the personal loan, and we consolidate those credit cards. The student loan is $245 um, a month for their minimum payment. Okay? So they're making their minimums of $1,792. The minimums are getting met. But they went through the work of the balanced budget and getting rid of non-essentials, and they found an additional $250 a month in found money. That became positive on their budget after their needs were met. Lifestyle did not change. They found $250. So they made a positive budget and still found an additional $250 a month after canceling subscriptions. We're going to be talking tomorrow about insurance and taxes. I will say it again. I don't think there's a faster way to put money back in your budget than to shop out insurance and know what you're asking for. I think that just about everybody in this room is probably overpaying insurance, and there isn't an insurance agent I know that's going to bring it to your attention. I've not met one yet. I praise God if I could find one. All right, so they're starting on their student loan. The student loan picks up. That's the one that they chose to do first. The student loan picks up the phone money. So instead of making their minimum, they're going to pay the extra $250 a month so the student loan right now is getting the extra, the excess, the abundance put and applied to the principal in making an additional payment each month on the principal to make that payment $495 a month. So a loan that would have been $7,000 divided by 245 is now a loan that's $7,000 divided by 495. So you've got February of 18 to March of 19 and instead of a three-year payment plan, it's paid off in 13 months. Student loan is gone, 13 months. 
because they disciplined themselves to find money, because they got themselves a balanced budget, and because they stuck to their plan, they are now out of that student loan in about six weeks from now. Okay? So now that 495, all of a sudden we don't have a student loan for that 495 to go to anymore. What do you think you do with the 495? Roll it. Roll it. It's not yours. It still belongs to somebody else. You're still renting money. The money is not yours. In God's eyes and in your own, you should see that money is not yours. It's money you can afford in your budget that's going out every month to a student loan that you have now been relieved from. Go reward yourself and get ready to pay that 495 again next month, exactly like you've been doing on your student loan. But now it's going against the personal loan, which the minimum on that personal loan while you've been paying off the student loan has been $469 every month. Your personal loan, starting in April of 19, now goes to $964 a month. You just went exponential on your principal, which automatically lowers the interest amount that you're paying because you're bumping down the principal. By the way, if you have the money and you have a mortgage, the fastest way to pay the least amount of interest on a mortgage is to make two payments a month rather than one. And I'm not saying make two payments, that your payments are $750 a month, and so you're paying $750 and $750. If you can do that, praise God, get that house paid off. I'm saying pay $375 and $375. You're going to still meet your minimum, but you are going to take so much interest off. If we ran that through the calculator, and I showed you what the difference of your interest was, we bought that $150,000 home last night, and there was a $208,000 or $280,000 cost of loan. If you make your minimum on the 1st and the 15th, that you're still satisfying the requirements of the loan, your loan interest will drop by six digits. Wow. So you make two payments, you're saying, instead of the one? Yes. Same amount of money. Same amount of your mortgage payment, but break it in half and make 50% and 50%. Why does that work? Because for two weeks every single month, there's that $400, $500, whatever of principal that they're not putting compound interest on. And it adds up fast. It adds up really fast. So if we were supposed to, if we were to start this now, do we make a full payment at the first of the month and then make another half payment in the middle of the month to satisfy the... No, you start it so that your second payment goes in before the minimum is actually due. So if your payment is due on the 20th, make a payment on the 1st, make a payment on the 15th, your minimum is due, and you go to the next month. Make another one on the 1st and the 15th. Make sure your minimum amount is paid by the time it's due. But what does that apply to? Is it, is it all forms of credit or just certain? All compound interest all loans. Compound interest. Yep. But I, I usually use the mortgage because it's the one that becomes the longest thorn. And it offers you the greatest equity. And the faster you get equity in your home, the more flexibility you have with other tools to use debt to find money with using consolidation. All right, so we're up to $964 right now on the personal loan. And we're still making our minimums on the first and the second mortgage on these other two. So at $964 on the personal loan, remember that balance was $31,000. That's a pretty hefty loan. So we go all the way to April of 2021. We started this plan in February of 18, okay? That $31,000 loan at a $469 a month payment, you're looking at approximately, somebody punch that in on the phone, please. What's 31.1 divided by 469? Anybody have a calculator on their phone? Anybody doing it? 31.1 divided by 469. Okay, five and a half years, 66 months, okay, is the term of this loan. So five and a half months, we're going to say it's going to be six years by the time they're done paying interest. Keep in mind that there's interest compounding on this loan. So what should be a 60-month term note on this personal loan, if you go from February 18 to April of 21, you are looking at February 18, three years and two months. You've taken uh, 22 months off the life of that loan. You just accelerated the repayment of that loan. So now you're down two loans and you haven't even been in the, at this for three years. And you're already, well, actually you're rid of three credit cards, now you're rid of your student loan, and now you're rid of the loan that paid the three credit cards. And you've been at it for three years. But now we get to the big ones. Oh boy, look at this. 
$60,500 and a second mortgage for $93,000. $153,000 of debt in that mortgage. So the money that freed up here, the $964,000, we're going to roll. It's not your money. It still belongs to somebody else. The $964,000 goes over to the first mortgage, the lower balance at this point. They're both the same interest rate, so it just goes to the lower balance to get rid of it before you start focusing on the bigger amount. So I'm falling over, sorry. Um, so now we've got 964 being added to the minimum of the 608, so that payment just went up to $1,572 a month. These are 30-year fixed, okay? So a 30-year mortgage with this acceleration of taking what has been paid off of these other loans is now put onto your first mortgage. So at $1,572 a month, we started in February of 18. And I ran it all the way down here now to the bottom, that in 7.75 years, keep in mind, we started $191,000 in debt. Because we've saved compound interest by accelerating our payments, but not breaking our budget, and still maintaining our lifestyle, in 7.75 years, from February 2018 to October of 2025, that person's debt-free. Out of debt. 7.75 years. This is the last payment right here is what I took this screenshot from on line 93, October of 2025. Is there any questions on that? This is what my wife and I did. I won't ask anything. No, go ahead and take the microphone away. Go ahead, ma'am. I don't want to avoid a question. Um, okay, like, I've been paying a loan on our mobile home, and uh, I've been paying, like, um, one payment and then half of a payment, mm -hmm. but I've been paying it at the same time. Now, where, where can I make less on the interest if I'm paying it at a different time during the month then? Or? No. Uh, what you're doing is you are taking your minimum and you're adding 50% of your minimum payment to each installment loan payment you're making. Right. That's awesome. Good for you. So whether usually it's easier on somebody that's living paycheck to paycheck to time those payments when they get paid, oh, I see. Okay. which is where the twice a month logic comes from. But if you're able to do that when your installment loan is due and just simply add 50%, phenomenal. Okay. Phenomenal. That's, that's, uh, that's doing the same thing as this logic of putting everything that you have extra that you're rolling onto the principal of the next loan. Okay. Okay. All right. Does this make sense? Did I go through that slow enough? It's simple, yeah. but you know what? It works. So now, these people started at $191,000 of debt. Your situation may be that you're only at 62000 but you might only have half the income. If you have a positive budget and you're willing to find money, it will work in any situation. And when you start the journey, when you put your foot in the Jordan, and you're carrying your own Ark of the Covenant, the waters will part for you. And you will have the suddenlies. You will get phone calls in the breezeway of the company that you're working for saying, I have a house, are you interested? It will happen. Quick question. Let's say I have a $5,000 loan, and they're taking $30 out a week out of your paycheck before you even see it. What happens if you add another $5 to it every week? After the 30 is taken out, that day you go in and you just give another 5 bucks to it. What happens to the... For every dollar you put towards the outstanding principal balance on a, on a compounding loan or debt instrument of any kind that compounds, any additional dollar towards principal will immediately put, if you want to say it puts money back in your pocket, or if you want to say it will not take as much money from your pocket, whichever angle you want to look at it, it will reward you by not being charged higher interest the next month. It will have a compounding effect on the principal by charging less compounded interest. Is that making any extra you can pay? That's what we're after, is we're looking to make more than the minimum. We're looking for anything that we can pull together in order to make more than the minimum payment to get rid of the one that makes the most sense. And usually the one that makes the most sense, whether it's the highest interest or not, is because of the victory dance, it's your lowest balance. 
that you can reward yourself and have something to praise God about and say, look what God has done. Just get rid of the lowest balance and roll that into the next one. But that is the approach that I recommend. Highest interest or not. Go after the consolidation loan to get the high interest ones out of the way. That'll work on anything, won't it? Like a car loan or anything. Even if you can't do it every month, every second or third month, month throw in an extra hundred bucks or so. That works the same way. As much as you possibly can. The, uh, the rule of thumb that like Dave Ramsey talks is 80-10-10 is your breakout of 100% of your income. A 10% immediately is a tithe. If you go to life point, 10% of your income between you and the Lord with the Lord's direction, but more often than not, the Lord is going to instruct you that 10% goes to your place of worship and that family of believers. 10% goes into savings, and it adds to your cash reserve, or it could go into a hold fund, like was talked about back here, of um, the extras in your life, vacations or whatever it may be. And then the 80% becomes what you have for your budget, and in that 80%, if you still have money at the end of the month, instead of just finding something to spend it on, if there's debt, bring it back and put it against the principle of a debt, no matter what that debt is. Whether it's a recreational vehicle or a car or your mortgage, use it and get your principal down and eventually get rid of that loan. And just as a validation to not changing your lifestyle, I'm talking about you should see my family in airports. We got into 10 years ago, excuse me, eight years ago, we decided that we were gonna do a family vacation every year. And my family loves the beach, so we go down to Florida to the beach. And uh, even though we are aggressively to the point of being debt-free in less than five years, we've never missed a vacation. We've still been able to keep our lifestyle. We're well-fed, we're well-clothed. We're not lacking anything at all. We are content, and we still take our vacations. It is doable. Anything else? All right. All right. We'll close in prayer and dismiss and come back at 1.30. All right. And Father, we love you. And Lord, we worship you. You are our God. You are our Abba Father. A good, good Father. And Father, I thank you for every ear that is tuned in today, whether online or sitting here in our presence we thank you for every soul, Father, that is reaching out for something more than what they've been experiencing. And Father, we pray down that increase on them. I pray that for each individual that takes the discipline and takes the initiative to begin this process, to set their foot in the Jordan, that Father, you will meet them where they're at and that you will give them those suddenlies, that you will give them those glory moments of favor and provision that are going to show them that you've got their back and what may look on paper to be a 9, 10, 12 year journey that Father, you're able to do it. They had provision in one day when the city was besieged. The four lepers found provision for the whole city. In one day, their situation changed. And Father, you are able, you are willing and we pray, Lord, that we would humble ourselves and be honest with where we're at, that we would allow ourselves permission to do this journey, to do this work, and to do it well in your sight, and to do it in agreement with those that are family or accountable to us, and then spread the word and tell others and guide others in that same journey. This works. We thank you for the confirmation of that, Father. We thank you for the testimonies. And we thank you for Jesus, who made all of this possible. And in that name we pray, amen. Thank you.